Where do the gods come from and where do they go? In the Greek worldview, the gods live forever and humans do not. That is the one essential difference between them. But interestingly enough, the gods do have births. They have beginnings. This is the Crane Bag Podcast, and my name is Jay Leeming. Today we're going to explore the birth of Athena, the gray-eyed goddess of beauty and strategy and wisdom, who was the guardian of many things, including the city of Athens. Thank you for joining me. Let us begin. God Zeus fell in love. Yes, indeed, the gods can fall in love. And perhaps they fall in love in a deeper and more intense way than mortals know. So he fell in love. He was killed in that battle. If to be killed is to spend all day remembering a face or a glance, or the touch of a beautiful hand. And the goddess he fell in love with was known as Metis. And she was a goddess of cleverness, yes. For she had the ability to change her shape. She could become anything she wanted to be. And she taught this skill to Zeus. She taught Zeus her tricks. And so he became able to transform himself as well. And so they would meet in Olympus as god and goddess. But then they would go off together And they would spend time together, not as god and goddess, but as stallion and mare. Or they would become two wolves racing across a snowy field in winter. Or they would become two eels or two snakes enjoying the delicious dry infinity of skin when they rubbed themselves together. They enjoyed the delights of love as fish, as cockroaches, as spiders, as snails, as tigers running madly through the jungle. And then, always, they returned to Olympus as god and goddess and were welcomed there. So they seemed happy together. But Zeus, nevertheless, had a wandering eye. And one day, In Olympus, he was walking along, and he came to a well, and at that well there was a goddess. And she was drawing water from that well. She was pulling a bucket of cool, crashing water out of that well. Her name was Hera. And Zeus looked at her, and he looked in her eyes, and there was a fire in those eyes. And there was coolness in the water of the bucket. And he saw the distance between these two things and how she embraced these distances. And he liked this. And he looked deep into her eyes and she looked back. And then she frowned and picked up her bucket and walked away. So Zeus walked away as well. But he could not shake the vision of Hera from his mind. Often he would remember her by day and by night. And soon after that, he and Metis did spend some time together. And they met as god and goddess, and then they went off together to enjoy the delights of love. But this time, Metis, she turned into a raccoon, and Zeus turned into a snake. 
and then she turned into a fish from the sea, a salmon, and he turned into a spider. And she turned into a peacock, and he turned into an ant. And she turned herself into a tiger, and he turned himself into a hummingbird. And then she became a fly buzzing madly in the summer air, and he turned himself into a frog. And his great tongue lashed out and took hold of her and swept her up into his belly, and he swallowed her, and she was gone. And then Zeus transformed himself into a sparrow. And as a sparrow, he flew from that place across Olympus. And as he flew through a forest of Olympus, rain began to fall. A sudden thunder shower fell from the sky. And the rain filled his feathers and beat him down as a sparrow. So he took shelter in one of the gardens of Olympus. But someone else was in that garden. Someone else had taken shelter there. He saw her, a goddess, beneath an oak tree, a large spreading oak tree dripping with rain. He looked and he saw that it was Hera. And she saw him. She saw the poor bedraggled sparrow. And she said in her heart, Oh, you poor sparrow, you poor thing. And she bent down and she picked him up from the grasses and held him close to her breasts. And as she did so, he cooed and whimpered, but a moment later, he turned himself into a cat and into a great tiger. And then he was Zeus himself. And Hera found she was no longer holding him, but she was being held. And she cried out, but her cries were muffled by Zeus's mouth. And he pinned her against that oak tree. And she cried out again and again. But after a while, whether those cries were of pain or of joy, it became hard to say. And when that rainstorm was over, the two of them returned hand in hand to Olympus. And the gods welcomed them. And some time after that, they were married, and Hera was crowned as Zeus's queen. And they were king and queen of the universe. So all seemed well and harmonious, well, as harmonious as things can be among the gods. But some time later, Zeus began to hear a sound. Tap, 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 went the sound. What is that, he said to himself. Tap, 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 tap. Is Hephaestus doing something, building something somewhere? What is that sound? Nobody else seemed to hear it. He looked around. Nobody heard it. It got louder day by day. Bam, 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 bam. Oh, this is not good, he said. It's in my head. What's going on in my head? Soon it became a loud crashing. Bam, 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 bam. Now what had happened was this. Metis, when she had been swallowed by Zeus, well, she had been pregnant. And she, being a goddess, had clever ways. She did not find a place to stay in his belly. No, she found a place to stay inside his head. So she was there pregnant with a child. And she was up there thinking to herself, and she said, my dear daughter, when she's born, well, she will need something. She will need a golden helmet. And so Metis took a hammer and began making this helmet, and that was the sound Zeus was hearing. Bam, 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 bam. He began to get horrible headaches, horrible headaches. And down on earth, things were strange. A woman sewing by a window of her house. At night, she saw a green ball of lightning go whizzing three times around that house and then flash exploding up into the sky. Out at sea, the waves became very high. At night, a sea captain looked at the mast. Red lightning flashed and struck the mast in a huge shower of sparks. There were hurricanes in January, earthquakes in the desert. Strange things were happening. And up there in Olympus, Zeus began to stagger around, reeling this way and that. Oh, my head, he said. Oh, my head. All the gods looked at him in fear and dismay. And then, just as suddenly as it had began, the tapping in his head stopped. And inside his head, Metis looked at the helmet she had made, the golden helmet. Oh, that's a good helmet, she said. This will be just right for my daughter. And down on earth, the seas became calm, and there was no more strange lightning and no more strange wind. And then Metis said to herself, But my daughter, she needs more than a helmet. I think she also needs a breastplate. 
and she took up her hammer and began pounding once again. Bam, 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 and again the headache started and Zeus began reeling this way and that, and down on Earth there were tornadoes in the jungle and hurricanes at the North Pole. It was crazy. Ships blown this way and that, people running for their hats in the cities and the villages, cows going this way and that. It was a horrible scene. Up there in Olympus, Zeus is staggering back and forth. My head, my head, what's going on? Hermes came to him, saw what was going on, and he said, quick, Someone send for Hephaestus. Send for him. Now Hephaestus, the blacksmith of the gods, had his workshop in a volcano where he worked with many cyclopses there, pounding away. But he heard the message and he came up to Olympus, those high realms. He entered Hephaestus, who always limps there. He has a bad leg. He came with his hammer and Zeus was reeling this way and that. Oh, oh man, the thunder in my head. It's horrible. And Hermes looked at Hephaestus and said, open his head. And Hephaestus looked at him with with dismay and surprise in his eyes, and Hermes said, Do it! And Hephaestus took three big wind ups with his hammer. And then he struck a mighty blow against Zeus's head. Bam! And as he did so, there was a huge crack that opened up. And out of that crack in his head jumped a goddess with gray eyes. And she had on a golden helmet and a golden breastplate. And she had a sword. And she said, Aha! I am Athena, goddess of wisdom and power. I offer you the world. And she took her sword and she bashed it against her breastplate three times. And every throne in the palace of Olympus chimed and rang in tune with that noise. And then she walked elegantly, lightly, to an empty throne there that was prepared for her. And as the throne hummed, she sat down in that throne and took her place there. And all the gods looked at her in amazement. And Zeus's head knit itself up again into one piece. And he stood up and felt a little better, a little better. And the gods looked at Athena, who seemed to glow with this light of having just been born. And they accepted her, and they nodded their heads, for they had seen that she was destined to take her place among them. Athena, the beautiful goddess of wisdom and of power. And so the gods welcomed her among them. And things went on as they do among the gods, sometimes stormy, sometimes calm. And Zeus and Hera were the king and the queen of those gods, and all the other gods bowed to them. But every now and then Zeus would say something a little unusual. A thought would come from his mouth, a strange, buzzing, whispery thought. Almost like a word scribbled in the air by a little fly. And the gods would look at Zeus strangely. And they would think in their hearts, Could that be? And I wonder if. But Zeus would give them an imperious look, and they would be silent. For he was, after all, the king of the gods. Thank you for listening to this story. That was the birth of Athena. Uh, yes, indeed. What a wild story. Oh, boy. We see those Greek statues. Perhaps you've seen them, pictures of them, uh, seen them in the real. Perhaps everything's so, you know, classical. Everything's so uh, perfectly composed. And then we get this story, which is almost like a comic book. What's going on? The gods are turning into stuff. Hephaestus comes with his hammer. Bang! But it's not a comic book. It's a belief system. It's a real a story, a real story um, that the ancient Greeks knew and um, held close to their hearts, so we can, so it seems. And so I just, for myself, I love stretching my definition of Greek myth to make it a little messier and wilder and wet with rain, like this story is. It's a crisis. Zeus has a headache. Bang! And out she comes. How do we want our goddesses? What do we want them to be like? 
We crave the goddess, that woman power, do we not? I've seen the movies. You've seen them now. It's a cool thing. Everybody loves women who are aggressive warriors these days. And there's nothing wrong with that, I suppose. But then we get this story. And we have an aggressive warrior goddess, Athena. Do we love that or do we not? Well, many people have said that this story is in fact a desperate attempt on the part of the patriarchy to claim Athena for themselves, basically. Because he's born out of, because uh, she's born out of his head. For crying out loud, that's just ridiculous, right? People are born out of ladies, not out of guys' heads. What's going on? So I can fully, uh, whether that's true or not, I could see that it might be true, definitely. It does seem in some ways like a desperate move to have Athena born out of Zeus's head. To make Zeus responsible for everything, I suppose, would be the motive. But at the same time, Athena is a battle goddess, you know, and we know her as that. In the Odyssey, she's a goddess of cleverness and of strategy and of war as well. Um, she's got her armor on. She's born with armor on. So in the form she's come down to us in the Odyssey, which is 800 BC, uh, for, so for the last almost 3,000 years, uh, it seems pretty perfect for me uh, that she was born out of Zeus's head. Um, she's a heady thing. She's not a goddess of uh, lavender and feathers and gentleness. No, no. She's an aggressive goddess. Um, now, perhaps she should have been born from another goddess. You can make that point. Absolutely. But anyway, I'm just saying there is something mental about her. And if you want a goddess, if any of us are seeking a goddess who is more earth-based, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't be looking at Athena at all. Maybe we should be looking at Diana, at uh, someone like that, at Durga in the Indian world, at Freya in the Norse, among the Norse goddesses, at Aphrodite, all goddesses connected perhaps with the earth and the roots of things in a more solid way than Athena, who is nevertheless a goddess of shattering light and uh, swords and armor and breastplates and aha, she comes. So those are some thoughts about this story, this wild and magical story in which all things change, in which love comes and then departs again, and the gods themselves change their shapes. Thank you for listening to this story. Uh, if you can support this podcast, please do so. Uh, those are the beautiful gifts which fuel this enterprise. Fuel? Do we want to talk about, talk about fuel? Maybe we, we want to talk about water and light, how those uh, feed growing things. And storytelling is a live thing. It's a growing thing. And uh, it needs to flourish. And if you are able to support uh, this podcast through Patreon, that's one way to help it to flourish and to get these stories out there. They're not mine. They're yours. They're ours. Um, but I am in a moment and in a place where I'm able to share them with you. And we can find out, all of us, what we have owned all along. You can find my, more stories at my website, uh, jleeming.com, J-A-Y-L-E-E-M-I-N-G.com. And uh, yeah, please get in touch if you'd like to with comments about this or any other storytelling things. Um, and what else do I have to say? The elevator in the soul goes to the highest floor, but it goes down to the lowest floor as well. The parking garage, the darkness, the subterranean place where the seeds of new stories grow. And those seeds will flourish, I hope, one day to become plants of unknown leafage, of unknown kinds of plants which will feed and nourish the future. And some of their seeds will be ignored and forgotten and go to the corners of the universe where they are perhaps deeply needed. Thank you for listening to this podcast and take care.